Hey programmers, Alvin here. Welcome back to another lesson in our trees topic. And this time around, what I wanna do is explore the depth first search algorithm. So we have two learning goals for today. What I wanna do is first implement a depth first traversal and we'll solve it in two ways, doing it iteratively as well as recursively. And beyond that, what I also wanna do is differentiate between pre-order, in-order and post-order, right? What do those three different terms mean? So to get going, I think what we should do is describe how depth first traversal actually travels through a tree. So what I'm looking to is at what particular order do I actually hit these nodes of this particular tree example? So we'll start at the root node A, and what's very characteristic of a depth first traversal is you travel as deep as you can to a leaf before you move laterally uh, through the tree. In other words, I'm gonna start at A, then I hit B, and before I go across and hit C, I actually go deeper and I can hit a node like D, right? So a proper depth first traversal starts with A, B, D. Now that I've bottomed out at a leaf node, right? There are no other children to explore below this one. And so I can move laterally and then I hit E. And then from there, there are no other nodes here. And my next node to hit would be C and then finally F. So you can really think about a depth first traversal as kind of like the opposite of a breadth first traversal, right? In a depth first traversal, we travel as deep as we go downward through the tree before we move across the tree. So a depth first traversal here overall gives me A, B, D, E, C, F. Recall that the breadth first traversal of the same tree would have given you A, B, C, D, E, F. So now that we know the general pattern for a depth first traversal, let's go ahead and figure out how we can implement this one. So recall that a breadth first algorithm used a queue under the hood. In a similar way, a depth first algorithm is going to require a stack. Recall that in a stack, we either add things to the very top of the stack or we remove things from the top of the stack. So as I trace through a depth first traversal on this tree, I'm gonna keep track of my stack. This line represents the bottom of my stack. And throughout, as we visit different nodes, we're gonna print them out on this line over here. So we'll start by initializing our stack with just the root node. So that means that A is on the stack. And now we actually begin our real algorithm. What I do is I can either just remove the top element of the stack or add a new top element to the top of my stack. Right now, I'll start by removing an element. So that means that I pop the A node. If I pop a node uh, from the stack, that means I'm visiting it right now. So because I just popped A, I am allowed to print it out. So here I printed out A, and now I need to consider A's children, right? So I look at the A node, and I look at its two children. What I do now is I actually push these children onto the stack. So that means I end up pushing C to the stack, and I also end up pushing B to the stack. So here's C, and here's B. Notice that if I push my right child first, that means that the left child is at the top of the stack, and that way we end up with a depth first traversal that kind of tends to explore the left hand side first, although technically it would still be a depth first traversal if you explored the right hand side first. Bottom line though is that I looked at A's children and I add them both to the top of my stack. At that point, that actually ends my first iteration of the algorithm. So onto my next iteration, which means I remove the top of my stack, which means I'm removing B. Since I just popped B, it means I am exploring it right now, so I print it out, and now I look at B's children, right? I look at B's children of D and E, and I add them to the top of the stack. Notice that E and D are all above the C node, and that actually gives me a way to make sure I explore a single path deeply bottoming out at a leaf node before I move to like another path laterally, right? So that ends my next iteration. Now I have D, E, C on my stack, and I just pop the top. So I'm popping off D, Right, so I remove it. I would try to add D's children, but D has no children. So I just print it out and I'm actually done with that iteration. Next iteration, E's on the stack. I pop it, I print it out. I look to see if E has any children. It has no children, so there's nothing to add in this scenario. Next iteration, I pop C. I print out C in my terminal, as well as considering C's children, right? C has just one child, so I take that lone child and still push it to the top of my stack. At this point, F is on the stack, I pop it, which means I explore it and I print it out. And there's nothing that F is going to add to the stack because F has no children. At this point, it's the case that my stack is totally empty, which means that I must be done with my algorithm. And there I have over here printed out all of my node values in a depth first order. All right, now that we have the high level strategy for how to implement a depth first traversal, it's actually coded up together. So here I already have a nice tree that I'm gonna deal with as the input to my depth first uh, function. This is the same binary tree class that we used in our previous lesson, right? So all I did was create my node class where every instance of a node uh, contains the value being stored as well as pointers to the left and right children. Then I just created instances of nodes as well as assign the connections between them, right? So doing these assignments should create this tree I have drawn over here. 
Let's work on our depth first print function. So for our depth first print, we're gonna take in some root node. In other words, someone should call this function by passing in the true root of a tree. In this case, the A node uh, is the root of my tree. Cool. And so we know that to start translating this strategy into some code, I'll just take some of those key variables that I kept track of, right? So a really important thing in the depth first uh, sketch that we did was we used a stack, right? So I'll use just an array as a stack, which means that I'll stick to using a pair of methods that manipulate the same end of the stack. Here I'll use push and pop because I know they always target the very last element of the array, which for us means the top of the stack, right? I'm gonna initialize this stack with just the root node at the start, right? That's gonna get the ball rolling. Then from there, how far do I wanna run this algorithm? Well, I need to keep running the algorithm while my stack has stuff on it, right? So while my stack is not empty, you gotta keep going, right? On the flip side, once the stack contains zero things, then you know you're actually done and you explored every single node, right? So you can finish your algorithm. Cool. So now that we're focusing in on one single iteration of this algorithm, what do we need to do? Well, I start by always just removing some item. And because I'm using a stack, that always means you remove the top of the stack. For me, that means stack.pop. So that's gonna remove the top element from my stack. I'll call that my current element. And a key detail uh, to focus in on when you're dealing with a depth first traversal is you consider something visited when it leaves the stack. Very similar to what we mentioned uh, for a queue in the breadth first traversal, right? And so uh, now that I have current over here, I think now is the perfect time to actually print out the current node's value, right? So I'm just accessing that node's internal value. In this case, it's just strings, but it could be really any type of data. And now that I've printed out uh, this current node and I explored it, I need to look at its children, right? So what I need to do now is uh, add curs children to the top of the stack. So now that I've taken care of the cur node, what I wanna do is take care of its children. And in particular, I need to add the current's children to the top of the stack. So I can do a stack.push. I'm going to push the two children, so I'll push cur.left and also cur.right, but I need to watch out here, right? Sometimes a node may not have some children, right? It could be the case that a node has no children, so it has no left and no right, or it could be the case that it only has a single child, so maybe only a left or only a right. So to handle those scenarios, what I wanna be sure to do is, is I don't add any like null values uh, onto my stack. To avoid that, I'll just use some if statements. So I need to check, hey, if my current node has a left, so if it's not equal to null, then I'll go ahead and push that left onto the stack and very symmetric for the right-hand side, right? If my current node has a right child, so it's not null, then I'll go ahead and also uh, push that right child onto the stack. Cool. So this code is looking pretty good. Let's actually test this code. That's really all there is to a, a depth first traversal. And there's probably one detail we need to fix, but let's just run it and see what we get. So if I run this code and I get a valid uh, depth first traversal, I should get the order of nodes in A, B, D, E, C, F. So let's give this a go. If you actually notice the order of those values, it actually looks like this. I did A, C, F, and then B, E, and then D. So this was a depth first print, but it actually went from right to left, right? Which technically is still a depth first print. To really match the output, we'll wanna make one small adjustment, right? If you look at these if statements, in particular, the order in which we push our, our children, if we push the left child and then the right child, that means that the right child is guaranteed to be at the top of the stack, right? The right child will always be above the left child, which means that next time around when we pop our stack, we would pop the right child first, which means we're visiting the right child first. So if you wanted a depth first reversal that also kind of went from left to right, then you'll wanna flip the order of these and make sure that you add your right child before your left child, which ensures that your left child's at the top of the stack always, and that means it's going to be explored before the right child. So with that small change, let's give that a go, and I get A, B, D, E, C, F, exactly what we're looking for. Cool, so there's a nice implementation of a depth first reversal. Notice that we implemented this iteratively. If we take a quick look at the code, it's actually almost identical uh, to the breadth first implementation, except that instead of a queue, we use the stack, which means of course we use those uh, properties or methods that are relevant uh, for a stack. In particular for us, that means pop and push, compared to the push and shift that I used uh, in a queue. And so uh, we'll just talk about the time and space complexity of this algorithm. So like you guessed it, the time is going to be O of N, 
right, where n is the number of nodes. That's because uh, we are eventually going to pop uh, every node of the tree from the stack. And I'm never going to do anything weird like add a node twice to the stack, right? Every node only enters the stack once and also leaves the stack once. And I run this entire loop uh, for every node of the input tree. And along with that, we also have an O of n space complexity because of that array that we created, right? We have to consider the space used up by this array. At worst, it may contain at most uh, just n nodes of the tree. So this was a nice iterative version of depth first traversal. I think any way that you slice it, you will probably always use a stack to implement a depth first traversal. That being said, we could have some variations on the implementation. So instead of using this explicit stack data structure, one way we can implement a depth first traversal is to use some recursion, in which case we're relying on like the underlying call stack, right? That still gives us that stack order that is going to be last in first out, right? So let's try to redesign our code just for funsies. Let's say I wanted to solve this now recursively, right? So I'm going to work on the same function, depth first print, but I should have no loops and I don't want to use like an explicit array, right? Instead, I need to rely on the call stack. So if you're going to think about this problem recursively, start with the base case, right? So my base case, like we always say, is when I have some input that is trivially simple, right? Usually like a trivially small input scenario where I don't have to do any additional work. I basically just solve the problem, right? So what I can think about right now is if the root is null, then I'm done. So I can just return, right? So what am I kind of saying over here? If I make this my, my base case, then the way I interpret that in my brain is I'll check, hey, if the tree is empty, right? If the tree is empty and right now I want to print out all nodes of the tree, well, then if the tree is empty, you don't need to do anything, just return, right? There's nothing to print out, so you're done. So this is going to be a really, really nice and clean base case for many recursive tree algorithms, right? A very common mistake that I see students make a lot is typically they write some like faulty base case or really a base case that isn't as clean uh, when they say things like if the root has no children, right? So that is a decent base case, right? And you would probably implement it like this, right? You would check, hey, if the roots left is null and the roots right is null. But in the long run, if you just handle this explicit scenario, then your code's gonna have to do some other weird things to handle the case where a node only has one child, maybe just the right node or just the left node. Things are actually a lot cleaner if you use this as your base case. Maybe I'll show you that code fleshed out later on. But for now, we'll stick to the valid code, right? So if the tree is empty, then your base case is do nothing, you're done, right? You're done printing everything. But let's say the tree is not empty. Well, what do I need to do? Well, I know I need to print values. Let's say that I console.log the value of this node, so of the root value. And then from there, I know I need to print out all of the values uh, in the left subtree and in the right subtree. So I'm really trying to think about this recursively, right? So let's say I'm tracing through this code. I know that no matter what, the first node I need to print out in my depth first order uh, should be A, right? So I'm gonna start by printing out A, and then from there, I need to recursively print out everything in the left subtree, so the BDE, and then everything in the right subtree, or the CF. So to structure that recursively, literally just print out your current root, and then recursively print out your subtrees, right? So I'll call depth first print on roots left, and also roots right. Cool. And again, really try to think about this recursively. So a tree contains many subtrees, right? In other words, if you really want to kind of see this in action, when recursion, we're breaking down a large problem into instances of the same problem that are just smaller, right? So this is a large tree. Here is a smaller tree, right? Even this thing is a smaller tree. So that's why I'm able to solve this one uh, using some recursion. So let's jump down and let's actually run this code. I should still get uh, A, B, D, E, C, F. And notice how short and clean this code is. Cool, so A, B, D, E, C, F, nice, and there we have it. So the analysis for this recursive implementation is actually exactly the same. We still have an O of N time complexity and still an O of N space complexity, right? We have N calls, basically one call for every node of the tree that we need to evaluate. And the space we consider here is now coming from the call stack. I think it's really cool how we can actually, you know, simulate uh, the call stack using this iterative code and really vice versa. We know that bottom line is either implementation somehow uses some stack ordering, which is a really neat pattern. 
So now that we've explored two ways to implement a depth first print, let's actually talk about some nuanced details. So in, in passing, you may hear about three different renditions of a depth first reversal, right? And those in particular are going to be called our pre-order, our post-order, and also our in-order. So these are three traversals and they're really all flavors of a depth first traversal, right? So if we talk about the pre-order traversal, that's technically what we have implemented over here. So let's say I stole this code and a pre-order would just look like this and I'll call it pre-order. And what you can actually see in the code is we call this type of a depth first traversal, technically a pre-order because I print out the parent before both of the children, right? So pre means before, I print out the parent before the children. So that's why it's a pre-order, right? So like we just saw when we do a pre-order traversal, I should print myself, then my left child, then my right child. And how can we see that pattern take place in just our like regular uh, depth first traversal? So I start at the root note. So I print out myself, I print out A. Then I go into my left child, right? The left child itself has to take care of itself, right? So it also prints out self, which is B, right? And then from there, I look at B's left, right? Which is D. So I print out D, right? Because eventually D becomes its own self node, right? And then at this point, if I look at the D node, there are no left and right children, right? So I'm done with that. So now I hop to B. Well, B just finished printing its left, right? So right now I'm in like the frame where B is the self and I already printed out B's left, which now means I print out B's right. So I print out E. Right? Notice that E is also going to become its own self, but E has no left or right children, so it's done. And at this point, I actually jump back to C. Right? I actually am now in the frame where self is A, and A just printed out its entire left-hand side. Right? It printed out B, D, and E already. So now, since A is self, it must print out its right-hand side, so it prints out C. From there, uh, C's left is actually nothing, so there's nothing to print out on the left-hand side, but then C prints out its right, which is just F, right? So I get my core uh, depth first reversal here, and just to you know, quadruple check that it works, and that's why I get this pre-order uh, depth first reversal. So if we're dealing with a post-order traversal, we follow the order of left, right, and then self. So a key pattern here is I only print out a node after its children are printed out. So technically the post order would here be D, then E, then now that D and E are printed, I print out B. Then from there I print out F and C, right? So a really important thing is I can't print out a C and then F because you print out your children before yourself, right? So it's going to be FC. And now that I've printed out everything but the root, I can finally print out the root, right? So let's run this post order. The implementation is almost identical to like a regular recursive depth first. You just place your console.log or your exploration in a very particular location. So let's give this code a shot. You should get D-E-B-F-C-A. Nice. And there we have it. And so finally, you guessed it, an in-order traversal is just a depth first where we print out a node uh, between its two children, right? So in general, I'm looking for printing out my left child, then myself, and then my right child. So I start with the root node, but because it has a left, I actually can't print it yet. So I go to my left child. B still has a left, so I can't print it out. So I go to D. D has no left, so it can actually print out itself immediately. So it prints out D. I would look at D's right child, but it doesn't exist, so I'm actually done with D. So now I'm back in the frame where B is the self node, right? So I can print out myself right now, print out B, and then I print out my right child. So B is gonna print out E, right? Cool. E has no children to take care of, so actually I'm done with this entire subtree. At this point, I know that if I root myself at A, so I say that A is my self node, it already finished printing out its entire left subtree. I right? printed out already B, D, E. So what it can do is print out itself. So I print out A, and then I print out my right child. So I try to print out my right subtree, so I look at C. C has no left child to print, so I just print out myself, and then I print out my right child, F. Right? So if I do a in-order traversal, I should get this order of nodes. So I should get DBE ACF. And there we have it. So key thing to understand about pre, post, and in-order is that they're all variations of a depth-first traversal. Right? They're very easy to implement uh, using some recursive implementation of depth-first. You just vary along uh, where you print out your values or you consider your values visited uh, compared to your recursive calls. Right? So pre means before. 
So print out yourself before your left and your right. Post means after, so print out yourself after your left and your right. And in order just means do it uh, between, right? Print out yourself uh, after your left, but before your right. So let's switch gears a little bit and work on a problem. So here, we're gonna work on a function that takes in the root of some binary tree, and this tree contains numbers at its values. What I wanna do is have my function return the total sum of all values in the tree. Previously, we solved this one using a breadth first reversal, and this time around, I'll solve it using a depth first reversal, and I'll show you two different ways to solve it, right? In other words, if you took in this binary tree as input, you should return the sum of all of these numbers, which should be 19. So if you know either like a breadth first or a depth first, you know many ways to solve this one, right? So let's just bang out a very quick depth first algorithm that solves this one. So here I just copy and paste it in my depth first code, and I'll adjust the name of this function. So now I'm calling this my sum tree. And I don't need to print out values. Instead, what I want to do is maintain like a running sum variable. Initialize that to zero. And like we did previously, right? All I need to do is sum plus equals cur.value. So as I visit nodes, as I remove nodes from the top of my stack, I add their values to my sum, finally just returning the sum. Very, very trivial uh, problem to solve if you know a depth first or a breadth first reversal, right? So I'll just check this code, and I'll show you a cooler solution than this one. So we'll give it a go. I should get a 19 from this one. Nice, and there we have it. So I think a very, very elegant way to solve this one, besides just using like an iterative depth first, is to go for the recursive approach, right? So I'll rewrite this function, this time uh, with some recursion, right? So I'm solving some tree, still taking in the root. And here is where we can either do a lot of work or do a little work, right? So if I'm gonna choose to solve this one recursively, I'll think about a base case scenario. So like I said previously, a really, really nice thing to do when you have recursive code for a tree algorithm is try to make your base case about the empty tree, right? So right now I'll check, hey, if the root is null. This is kind of like a weird question to ask, but let's say someone gave you an empty tree and they asked you to find the sum of all values in that tree. Well, there are no values. So actually a logical answer here would mean that you just return zero, right? If you had to sum the values in a tree of no nodes, well, there are zero nodes, so their sum must be zero, right? So here I'm just returning zero if my tree is empty. Cool, so that's actually a nice base case. And now I have to think about this problem in the recursive scenario, right? So what I can do is I can calculate some total sum where I just take my current node, so I take my root value, and I add it with the sum of everything in the left subtree and the sum of everything in the right subtree, right? So to really tackle this one recursively, let's consider marking this diagram up. So the large problem I wanna solve here is finding the sum of all values in this giant tree, right? So I wanna break this down into smaller problems that have the same shape. So let's say I was magically able to find the sum of all values in this small subtree. I know that the sum of those values is just going to be four. In the same way, if I found the sum of all the values in the right subtree, so this kind of lopsided tree over here, seven plus five is just going to be 12. So that's the sum over there. Now I basically just solved it. I can take this number, add it with my current root, and take this right-hand number, right? Four plus three plus 12 actually does give me 19, right? So the way I tackle this one recursively is to consider the sum of the subtrees, right? So I can actually solve this in a one-liner. To find the sum of the tree where I'm rooted right here, I can find the sum of everything in my left subtree, add myself to it, so add my root.value, then also add everything that's in the sum of the right subtree, so root.right. Cool. So let's give this a go. So I'll run this code, I'll run trees.js, and I should get 19. And there we have it. And this code is very, very elegant, very, very short code. So we see that this code works, but I think most students kind of struggle with this kind of situation where we actually utilize return values. Uh, they struggle with it more than just a regular recursive depth first reversal, but it really utilizes the same exact code, right? I'm just adding things together uh, after I'm done recursing. So I'll tell you what, Let's actually zoom this in a little bit and I'll really trace through exactly how this code behaves on this particular tree example. All right, so let's start really tracing through this code. So we know that when we call some tree, they're passing the root node, which is this node over here, right? So I check, is the three node null? 
It's not, so I go to my recursive case, in which case I have to evaluate this expression, right? Find the recursive call of the roots left. So now I go to the left node over here. So I'm at the two node. And the same thing happens, right? Two, if I run it through the base case, is not null, so I keep going. So I must go to my left child again. So now I'm at four. Technically, four also passes the base case, right? I check, is the four node uh, equal to null? It's not, so I look at four's left, right? I'm running line 195 where my root is four. If I look at four's left child, it's actually going to be null. So imagine I'm kind of in this space over here where my cursor is where root is null. I know that that automatically returns zero, right? If root is null, I just return zero. So four is gonna get back on its left-hand side zero over here. Nice. And then from there, what do I do? Well, I also need to find the sum of my right subtree, right? So right now I'm in the frame where root is four. If I take the sum of the right subtree, four's right is also null. So I know that it itself is also going to return zero. And what happens in this subtree? Well, I do zero, right? Plus four plus zero. So technically on the call to the four node, it's going to return to its parent just the total sum of four, which makes sense, right? And something very similar happens for this right subtree, right? You can imagine that negative two's left is zero, its right is also zero. If you take the sum of zero, negative two, and zero, that gives you back negative two to the parent. And here's where things start to get interesting, right? So right now I'm at the frame where root is this positive two over here. I know that my root's left sum is four, my root's right sum is negative two, I just add myself to it. So I do four plus two plus negative two, that gives me four up top. So I'm returning four to my parent. Cool. So right now I'm at the frame where my root is three. I already have evaluated my left hand, like partial sum, and I need to also find my right hand sum. So look at three's right child, which is seven. I know seven's left child is null, so that returns zero. If I look at its right child, it's five, right? Now that I'm at five, so right now root is five, it's left child zero, it's right child zero. I take the sum of this small subtree and it's five. And now I'm back in the frame where root is seven. I add zero, seven, and five, because that represents my root's left, my root itself, and my root's right. So zero plus seven plus five just gives me 12. And now I'm back in the frame where root is three. And I add up all these values, four plus three plus 12 gives me a total sum of exactly 19. All right, so that's how I reconstruct the sum over here. And that's why it's really, really neat that we made our base case about the empty tree. We know that if we have an empty tree, its sum is basically zero. So the complexity analysis of this is identical to what we did for our recursive depth first reversal. So it's going to be O of N time and also O of N space where N is the number of nodes in the tree, right? We have O of N time because we're making a recursive call for every node of the tree. And we have O of N space uh, just from the space we use on the call stack. So there we have it. In this video, I showed you how to implement a depth first traversal uh, using iterative code as well as recursive code. We also looked at the differences between pre, in, and post order, right? Remember that pre, in, and post order are all variations on depth first. And in it, we just vary how we explore our current node relative to our children.